cosmic judgment. Uh, and again, uh, Isaiah picks up uh, this come before the celebration of the birth of your son Jesus in Bethlehem. Help us to realize that you are with us always and that we should look to you as the source of our life and our salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Okay. Let me just rearrange some things here. Okay, so for, we're in this section of uh, Isaiah, we're still dealing with uh, the cosmic judgment. Uh, and again, uh, Isaiah picks up uh, this uh, strong judgment theme. Uh, for the purpose of trying to teach the people of Israel to remain faithful to God uh, and also to forewarn them because, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like trying to warn a kid, you know, uh, don't play in the traffic, don't play in the traffic. And if they want to play in the traffic, what could possibly happen? I know that's a very gruesome illustration, but if you consider what God is saying to his people, Believe and trust in me and you will have life and salvation. If you don't believe and trust in me, you have death. And how many of us would ever sit there and say, well, let's just choose death. <laughs> now, keep that in mind. Uh, we'll see how far we get to um, uh, in Isaiah. But I've already uh, started prepping this uh, section here. The deal with death. Guess what? God is going to make the case saying, you did make a uh, deal with death. But let's pick up uh, where we kind of left off uh, last time. We're in Isaiah chapter uh, 26, um, verse 20. Uh, Come, my people, into your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed by. In one essence, this is a little bit of a warning, okay? Yes, uh, there's going to be the exile. Yes, there's going to be that time of tribulation. And notice what God is wanting them to do is to sort of stay inside. It's almost like, you know, in the midst of this uh, COVID pandemic is what should we be doing? Okay, stay inside, okay? Uh, but uh, God is saying, when you're staying inside here, kind of remember me, okay? So there's a little bit difference here, okay? But I, I want to, you to also uh, take a look at something else that um, a fury or something really bad is going to be coming. And where do you gather for safety? Church, you knew exactly where I was going to be uh, leading you to. Uh, it is where we gather around God's peace, his forgiveness through his word. We gather at church. And so I want to take you back in time to another part of scripture from uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse uh, 13 and 14. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. So in one essence, what happened is God was going to destroy the earth and told Noah, take his three sons and their wives and Noah and his wife into the ark. Eight people besides all the animals and that would be the place of safety. For us as Christians, the place of safety is in Christ, uh, where his word is proclaimed. So right here in church. Because even if something does happen to us physically, as long as our faith is trusting in Christ, we know how it's going to end. So God is also going to be doing the same thing with the whole exile type thing, concept. Is what's going to happen to the promised land? It's going to be laid waste. Verse 21, For behold, the Lord is coming out of, from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. And the earth will disclose the blood shed on it. 
and it will uh, no more cover its slain. So here you have uh, that, that concept that um, you have that day of judgment, that things will be revealed, that God will be coming out. Um, and you, the dark deeds will be exposed. Peter actually says something similar in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse uh, t I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So on the last day, you're going to have all that evil being exposed and used as punishment uh, for those who do not uh, believe and trust. That will be the, the fruits of their work, and it will be exposed. Now, at this point, you might have a little bit of fear then. As Christians, you might be thinking, well, what about all my sins? What about all my mistakes that I've made in life? Will they also be exposed? And the quick answer to that is, no, not really, because you are covered with Christ. All your sins are taken away. This is why we rejoice with the Savior. Can we believe it that all our mistakes, and we make the same amount of mistakes, if not even more than the rest of the people of this world, but our mistakes are covered, not because of anything we have done, but because we believe and trust in a Savior who covers our sins. But if you're an unbeliever, like the people of Israel at this time, they were not trusting in God, then you're going to have to face your mistakes by yourself. Okay, uh, John, quick question. If uh, we were going to have the second coming of Christ, uh, and these things are going to happen during the second coming, this is, this is the third coming. Ah, uh, yes and no. Let, let me put it this way. Uh, so when we talk about the exile, is uh, you, it, the exile was likened to that last day when Christ will come again. But it's not necessary, and it is uh, a form of punishment, of discipline, okay? And we're going to get to it in just a little bit later, and uh, hopefully we'll get to it today, but we'll find out, where God makes a difference between the punishment of Babylon and the discipline of the people of Israel. So there's a difference, okay? Um, so yes, the people of Israel are going to feel that this is a terrible punishment, but with what's going to happen to Babylon, this was absolutely nothing, okay? Uh, Babylon will be then completely wiped out. They were just put into slavery, okay? So there is a little difference, so I don't want you to think of the exile as one of the quote-unquote coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There, we're going to focus on two comings, his first coming in Bethlehem and his last, and his second coming on the last day. Okay. Uh, Hilda, you had a question? A clarification on what it means when it says, and then the heavens, clarification of heavens, uh, will pass away with the Lord, and then the heavenly bodies will be from God. What's the definition of heaven and heaven and earth? I'll be honest. I don't necessarily know, per se. I think that might have been more of an expression. Sometimes um, uh, scripture, when, when scripture talks about the second coming of Christ, uh, it will talk about how everything on earth will be destroyed and that there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth, okay? But exactly what is the heavens? And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. And scripture can use the word heaven as the sky. It can also use the, the word heaven as a place where God abides. Okay. Um, and so it has multiple uses for the concept of heaven. And so maybe the best way to describe it is not earth. Uh, exactly where is God in the heaven? Uh, like the, um, uh, 
that people had this idea that you know when we first started putting people into outer space and launching them into orbit that they would be able to finally see God and the answer was no you really can't see God okay um, but then I'll give you a little bit of a, a glimpse pardon a little bit of a pun there uh, when you get to the angels announcements to the shepherd uh, this is coming up in a daily devotion, probably, I think, the day of Christmas. Um, all of a sudden, you have the heavenly host appearing. And I use the illustration in the daily devotion. It's not like, you know, the Sunday school Christmas pageant where, you know, the kids start huddling up on stage and it takes them a few seconds to appear. All of a sudden, they're just there, okay? And uh, some people have entertained the idea that the heavenly host is always there. We just always, we can't always see it. And so it's almost like God turning on the light. Now we can see it. Now they can proclaim this to the shepherds and then God turning off the light. But they're still there. And so, again, there's a, there's a few different models out there um, in trying to describe something that's really beyond us. So I really can't give you um, an exact picture of what will happen on the last day. I was wondering if the heavenly bodies, because we are in a spiritual battle and we have part where the angels were sent you know, out of heaven, and I'm wondering if the heavenly bodies are, are the, the heavenly bodies that are not following God that will be burned in the soul. You know, I don't know. Uh, I can probably do a little bit more. Um, uh, deeper dive into uh, what Peter was trying to say here, uh, but I have n I'm going in, in quickly in the back of my mind. I don't know if heavenly bodies has ever been used to describe the host of angels that follow Satan. I'm trying to figure out if there's another parallel to that in Scripture, and I don't think so. Um, but I, I can see where you're coming up with that is that you know you're talking about uh, angels and you're talking about created things and is this then a, a reference to um, um, the punishment of Satan and his angels um, again I'd have to do a deeper dive and get back on to, back to you on that I'm not exactly too sure about that just because it does describe it being burned up and in hell is uh, not annihilation. It's not where so things are just burned up. It's actually eternal torment. So there's a little bit of a difference there, but yes. The study notes describe the heavenly bodies as the sun, moon, and stars, etc. Yep, uh, that, that's also another aspect of describing like the heavenly bodies as, like you said, the sun, moon, stars, the planets, everything around, and so forth. Yeah, so I don't know that it's talking about bodies as in physical bodies, I think it's more of the um, out there sun, moon, and stars according to the notes here. Okay. Um, yeah, so the bottom line to it is we don't have an exact timetable of what's going to happen with the second coming of Christ. Um, but for the believer, we know what's going to happen to us. And that's what we should be hanging on to. What's going to happen to, with us is we will be with Christ in paradise. Um, and that there is nothing to fear. Even though there's going to be a lot of traumatic things happening, our security, our eternal life is all based in Christ. So as we look at this day coming, and this day in this picture from uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, may present a lot of uh, you know, a, a bad picture per se, we know as Christians we are safe because we are protected in Christ. But um, if we're, the next slide, however, is going to give you also another interesting picture as we get back into Isaiah. Okay, uh, again, it's going to be talking about that, that last day concept, and it says, in that day, the Lord with his hand and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. 
Okay, so, you know, right now I also have another big, huge question mark here if you're going to ask me, well, what is Leviathan? Um, it can be used for a couple of different things, so we don't know exactly what the creatures are that uh, Isaiah is trying to give us a picture of, but we do know what their result is. They will be destroyed, okay? Uh, the enemies of God will be destroyed. Um, uh, I also don't have a problem, because I know we covered off on this previously, of using where Isaiah uses the word of a flying, fiery serpent. Uh, you know, a dragon, being a dragon. Okay, I really don't have a problem with that, even though there are some people that would say, Pastor Paul, there's no such thing as a dragon. Well, at least not in our modern time, but who knows what happened previously. Um, but at the end of the world, this isn't a battle with a physical dragon, but we have to remember, really, that dragon is a picture of Satan. And that was something we talked about at the beginning part of class before we really got started here. You know, when you have uh, that manger scene, is do you have a dragon there by it? Well, if you're following the book of Revelation, um, the dragon was given that, that picture of the, those symbols of uh, being there and trying to devour uh, Christians and the church. Um, and so let me just go to a little bit of that uh, from Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And the great dragon who was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Okay, and again, this is just giving us a picture of uh, Satan and his attack, especially on uh, the church, after he was uh, tossed out of heaven, per se. Okay, but bottom line to it is, yes, we know on that last day there's going to be a lot of destruction. There's going to be a lot of pain and misery for those who don't believe. But for those who believe, there is 100% comfort. Okay, so um, let, let me continue on, and uh, we're going to be in uh, letter H where it says, The vineyard revisited. Previously in Isaiah, Isaiah used the illustration of a vineyard, trying to describe God and his relationship with his people. And let me pick that up in Isaiah chapter 5, and let me just grab a couple of those verses there. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on the very fertile hill. Verse 6. Uh, and then can pretty much after it abandons its uh, creator, so to speak. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed. And briars and thorns shall grow up. And I will also command the clouds that they will, that they rain, no rain upon it. So here again is a picture of the people of Israel being described as a vineyard, and God had taken care of this vineyard, but it did not produce the grapes, the fruit of the faith that God wanted. Instead, it rebelled, and so God said, I will make it a waste. I'm going to get rid of this vineyard. However, now the situation is going to be a little bit changed because with this first vineyard analogy, this would have been pre-exile for the reason for the people of Israel to go into the exile. But after the day of judgment, after God's wrath is appeased, now something is a little bit different. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 27, 2 and 3. In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it, I am the Lord, am its, I the Lord am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it, I keep it night and day. So after the exile, after the people of Israel are returning home, guess what? You have a restoration of that vineyard analogy. And God is taking care of his people and his people are believing and trusted, trusting in him. And again, to pick up a little bit of the reversal from 
chapter 5, verse 4, I have no wrath. Would that I had thorns and briars to battle, I would march against them. I would burn them up together. So after, and you could say, maybe here's a better illustration to kind of describe this. God is always angry with our sin, but God's anger is appeased when Christ makes his atonement for our sin upon Calvary's cross. And now God covers us with his righteousness, and God loves us and forgives us. So Christ has no more wrath uh, because uh, he had, or God has no more wrath because Christ took it. But if you're embracing Christ, you are rejoicing. But if you're pushing Christ out of your life, you're basically saying to God, I will stand up for my own sins. Whatever I've done wrong, I will make my own atonement for. Well, you're going to get wiped out with that. Now, verse 4 may present us with a little bit of an English problem here. Uh, I have no wrath. I think we, we can probably understand that. But when God says, would that I had thorns and briars to battle, I would march against them. I would burn them up together. Um, I like what the New American Standard Version of the Bible says for a translation. It says, I have no wrath. Should someone give me briars and thorns in battle? So should someone attack me, okay, then I would step on them and I would burn them uh, completely. So here you get the protective nature of God protecting his vineyard or protecting his people. But there's an or. It goes on to verse 5. Or let them hold, lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. Christ is speaking from um, verse 4 and 5 together here is basically saying you have a choice here, people. You can either believe and trust in God, which is life and salvation, or you can reject God which is eternal death and damnation. Which one are you going to choose? And we already saw a little bit of the outline and how they're going to choose death, but that's still yet to come. Uh, verse 6. In days to come, Jacob shall take root, Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. Now, in this verse here, you have, again, um, the, uh, that illustration of that uh, vineyard blossoming and growing and expanding. Just like the gospel message goes beyond just the Jewish people, it goes to the whole world. And that was God's plan to begin with, that the whole world would be saved. But the Messiah would come, of course, through the Jewish people, through Abraham and his descendants. There would only be one Messiah, and that was the people group that God chose. But the effects of the Messiah, what the Messiah was trying to accomplish, would benefit the entire world. The key is you continue to believe and trust in Christ the Messiah. Okay, let's get back to our outline here. Um, the final destiny of the city and the Lord's people. Okay, that, that almost sounds a little bit, uh, okay, what, what's going to happen here? Uh, is this going to be good or bad? It depends. Are they going to believe and trust or are they going to continue to reject? And here's one of the things that I was trying to, I think, to answer kind of uh, John's question about the exile. Was the exile uh, like that last coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? And uh, let's pick up from Isaiah chapter 27, 7 and 8. Has he struck them as he struck those who struck them? you are got to be thinking, there's a lot of struck thems in that verse here. Or have they been slain as their slayers were slain? 
these are poetic type uh, verbiage here. Measure by measure, by exile you contended with them. He removed them from his fierce breath in the day of the east wind. Okay, so the, the question that God is asking the people of Israel post-exile is, uh, you suffered in Babylon, right? And the answer is yes. You come home and Babylon is completely wiped out and struck down. Okay, they also suffered. Who got the worst suffering? The answer is Babylon did. So there's a difference between the discipline of a loved child and the punishment on the last day. So while we may think of our lives and the challenges in our daily lives as God is bearing his weight upon us and it's almost too much for us to handle at times, and the answer is no, God still loves you. If you want the true judgment of God, that will be much, much worse. So the author of the Hebrews in chapter 12 puts it this way, verse 6. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. For it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? So God's trying to teach the people of Israel coming back from exile that this was a discipline. If you want judgment, take a look at what happened to Babylon, okay? And ultimately, what will happen to Babylon on the last day? Eternal torment. That's not as bad as what you had to endure for a little while while you were in exile in Babylon. So let's get back to uh, Isaiah here, chapter 27, verse 9. Therefore, by this, the guilt of Jacob will be atoned for, and this will be the full fruit of the removal of his sin, when he makes all the stones of the altar like chalk stones, crushed to pieces. No asherim or incense altars will remain standing. So for the people of Israel, there is an atonement. There is a satisfaction for those sins. And the result of that satisfaction of sins, you would see a change of heart in the people of Israel. So they would no longer go after the fake gods of the ashrams or the incense altar, but then worship the true God. If your sins are forgiven and you're in a proper relationship with Christ, you're going to be worshiping Christ. You're not going to be rejecting the Christian faith, correct? It's a little bit of a rhetorical question. Because what happens if you do reject the Christian faith? Can you fall away? The answer is yes. Then if you fall away, you put yourself back into a bad category. And so the next verse is going to pick up on that little bit of that backward falling. Now, depending on your English Bible, you might notice some extra gaps and a little bit of spacing. I notice in my ESV Bible, they have a little bit of spacing here and there on the screen. I don't show the spacing. Uh, the reason why is, I will admit, when you get to this section of Isaiah, it gets really, really tough. You get two verses in a little space and another two verses in a little space. And it's because the prophet Isaiah is jumping around quite a bit. And so sometimes the Bibles will say, I want to space this out to you so that you know this is kind of a little bit of a different section, but still in the same chapter. Okay, because as you get this rhetorical question of sorts, okay, you know, bottom line is your sins are going to be atoned for. You're going to be saved and delivered. So you're not going to go back to the false gods, right? Let's pick up verse 10. For the fortified city is solitary, a habitation deserted and forsaken. Like the wilderness, there, is, there the calf grazes. There it lies down and strips its branches. A fortified city. And I want you to picture 
a city with a lot of walls, okay? But if you're an inhabitant of that city trusting in the wall, you're not trusting in God. If you're an inhabitant of the city trusting in God, then God becomes that wall. I know it's a little bit of a, a strange line of thinking, but just think of it this way. If you're trusting in God, God will take care of you. But if you're trusting in the city and not God, that city will fall. So let's go on to verse four, 11, sorry. When uh, its uh, bras are dry and they are broken, women come and make a fire out of them. For this is the people without discernment. Therefore, he who made them will not have had compassion on them. He who formed them will show them no favor. So they are trusting in the wall, not in God. And so the scripture says they have no discernment. They're not seeing God in the midst of their lives. And because of it, uh, there's going to be no compassion, no favor. But if you see God, then there is atonement. You're going to put away the fake gods and get away from them, and you will be protected. I like how uh, Luther has an interesting note regarding this section here. Luther has something for us to have wrestle with a little bit. He writes this, They regard their punishment as martyrdom. They ascribe their well-being to their own works and never truly give God credit. So coming out of exile back to the promised land, did they learn their lesson? Luther is almost like, maybe not, because they still were having a hard time trusting in God. They continued to bring up the, the false gods that got them into exile in the first place. And they felt that, you know, because they suffered this exile in Babylon, that they atoned for their own sin. Ah, but it doesn't work that way. You need a savior to atone for your sin. You need Christ. You need to believe and trust in God. And so Luther is trying to give you the idea that the exiles coming out of uh, uh, Babylon back to the promised land, they were thinking, look what we endured. Uh, no, it was God who put you there, God who brought you out. And by the way, while you were there, it was God who was sustaining you. Will you wake up and acknowledge God finally? And Jesus Christ, the first thing he did was use the word atonement. Pretty much. Pretty much. You've got to remember as um, uh, after Christ's birth and his circumcision, naming, visit in the temple at 12 years old, you now move into the John the Baptist account, which has that simple message, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent. Okay? Trust in God. Okay, and why did Christ take on flesh and blood to make atonement? Okay, but let's get back to Isaiah here. Uh, let's finish up uh, this uh, chapter here, 27, um, 12, verse 12. In that day, from the river Euphrates to the brook of Egypt, the Lord will thresh out the grain, and you will be gleaned one by one, O people of Israel. And in that day, a great trumpet will be blown, and those who were lost in the land of Assyria and those who were driven out to the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain of Jerusalem. So I want to put two pictures in your, hand, in your head. Uh, the gleaning, the separation of those who believe and those who don't believe, okay? Bottom line to that, but yet you've already been given a picture by Luther and previously in Isaiah that even coming out of exile, maybe they didn't quite all believe. And so then what will that last day be like? It will not be a good day. But what do you want to do with those who were lost in the land of Assyria? Those who were driven out of the land of Egypt will come and worship the Lord on the holy mountain of Israel you got to remember that the, for the Jewish people, 
they, they were the people that the Messiah would come to redeem all of humanity, including the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles who believe and worship, even though they were not necessarily direct descendants of Abraham, they will worship Christ. Okay? So again, it's faith is the key, not the DNA. It's faith. And so what Isaiah is trying to do is trying to teach the people that. Stop just trusting in your heritage alone. Do you believe? Do you trust in God? Stop looking at your bloodline. It's a matter of the heart. Okay, so now we're going to change. Uh, let me stop here at this point. Any questions? Because I'm going to be changing a little bit more of a direction here. Or probably the same direction, but a little bit of a different uh, emphasis. So going into chapter 28, uh, we now have the future of Samaria and its leaders. Okay, And you've got to remember... Um, and I will admit, this is also one of those very difficult sections, okay? Uh, but leaders are people in charge of people, and usually those people should have, a, have an extra level of responsibility. And you would think that the leaders should be doing the right thing, especially for the people, but as we know, leaders don't always do the right thing for the people. So let's start unpacking verse 1. Ah, the proud. Yeah, by the way, whenever scripture talks about the proud, you never want to be in that company. Okay? I like how St. Paul puts it. I probably should have put that up there. Uh, if I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in Christ. Okay? But when, when God calls somebody proud, start running away from them. Okay, the proud crown the drunkards of Ephraim and the fading flower of its glorious beauty which is on the head of the rich valley of those overcome with wine. Eee. So you're getting proud people and a little bit maybe indulging too much wine here. Okay, which again does not make for a very good strong leader, does it? Verse 2. Behold, the Lord has one who is mighty and strong, like a storm of hail, destroying tempest, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters. He casts down to the earth with his hand. God has used uh, countries before to bring the people of Egypt, I'm sorry, Israel into um, uh, slavery, into Babylon, uh, the Assyrians, and now you're kind of getting going back to that illustration. Remember, throughout Isaiah, you're going to have this continual theme. God has given his people grace. They fell away. He puts them in exile. He brings them back. Throughout this whole process, he's hoping that they're going to believe and trust in him. You have the final judgment, and now it almost seems like we're starting back again with the Assyrians here. Why? Because they were still proud. They were not, they, their hearts were not broken. <laughs> Verse 3, the proud crown of the drunkard of Ephraim will be trodden underfoot, and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is on the head of the rich valley, will be like a first ripe fig before the summer. When somebody sees it, he swallows it as soon as it is in his hand. Oh, I love that illustration. Who represents the fig? Uh, the people of Israel who are going to be devoured up into exile. And as we, God is using this as like the first fig of the harvest. Uh, true story. Uh, it happened to my uh, vicarage supervisor, the vicar before me, so I was not the one who did this. He always had a garden in his backyard and was very, very, he enjoyed his garden, I'll just put it that way. And he looked forward to the garden, especially for the first red tomato. <laughs> that first tomato of the season. And so he goes to his window and he looks and he sees 
this nice bright red object out there like a tomato. And so he gets dressed and he goes out there only to find out that the vicar, that would be the student uh, pastor, played a little bit of a joke on him and took a red marker and colored a um, tennis ball with it. <laughs> but from a distance, you're not gonna know that. So he was just like, oh, the first red tomato, I can't wait, and then he goes out there and finds out it's a red tennis ball. <laughs> well, that type of anticipation that God is using that, ooh, this is a ripe fig, the first one of the season, I can't wait to get it. God is actually using that as an illustration of his wrath being given to a neighboring country to come and wipe out the people of Israel. That the people of Israel are that fig or that tomato, so to speak. And these other nations are like, I can't wait to get this. This is just prime for the taking. The first harvest of the season, let's go and grab them. But again, it gives you that idea that God is in charge of this. God is making the people of Israel look desirable to their enemies for the purpose of putting them into exile. And again, you might be thinking, that sounds really harsh. As John was asking, who's the fig? Uh, God's people. Why? Because they were rebelling. And God wanted to discipline them so that they would turn their hearts. Uh, five and six. In that day, the Lord of hosts will be a crown of glory. Notice the difference between like the crown earlier of wine, and this is now more of a crown of glory, and a diadem of beauty to the remnant of his people, those who believe and trust, okay? and a spirit of justice to him who sits in judgment, and strength to those who turn back the battle at the gate. Oh, we've, we've got a little bit of, um, you could say prophecy coming up here in this uh, verse. Okay, so what you have is God using that same illustration of uh, the, in the earlier about the crown, uh, now no longer a drunkard, but a crown of glory, diadem of beauty, um, and talking about the remnant against, again, the people coming out of exile, people who should be believing, okay? And a spirit of justice of him who sits in judgment and strength of those who turn back the battle. Um, Luther mentions that this could be in a prophecy of those key leaders that would help rebuild the temple after the exile. And so Luther mentions specifically people like Ezra, Zerubbabel, Haggai, Nehemiah, because one of the first challenges they had to face was to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And here God is, or through Isaiah, is saying, yes, those who turn back the battle at the gate and having a strong emphasis that says, we need to rebuild here and remember God and rebuild um, Jerusalem. Let's go on to uh, verse 7 and 8. These also reel with wine and stagger with drunk, strong drink. The priest and the prophets reel with strong drink. They are swallowed by wine. They stagger with strong drink. They reel in vision. They stumble in giving judgment. For all tables are full of filthy vomit with no space left. I know, what a vivid illustration here. But bottom line to it is, again, these, these exiles coming out of ex, uh, exile should be believing and trusting in God. Their priests, their pastors, should be teaching the people to follow God and to be faithful to God, but they're not. So one of the struggles that the post-exile prophets had was to rally up the people and saying, come on, people, let's rebuild the, the gate, let's rebuild the temple, we got work to do. And they're like, let's just eat, drink, and be merry. We're out of the slavery. No, don't you understand? If you're not going to follow God, you're not out of slavery. 
And this is what God wants you to do. Who's stumbling? Uh, the leaders who are not following God, the, who are leading the people and almost opposed to the prophets that God sent to say, hey, let's rebuild uh, Jerusalem, let's rebuild the temple, let's get back to the way things were supposed to be. And they're like, hey, we're free, we're free, we're free, let's just enjoy the, uh, the land and worry about ourselves. And God had to send the later prophets and saying, uh, no, you've got to worry about this relationship with God because if you get that messed up, you're not really free. Um, and things could be worse. So these are leaders who should have known better, so to speak, but they stumble. That shouldn't surprise us that leaders stumble. Okay, verse uh, 9 and 10. To whom will he teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk, those taken from the breast? For it is precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Okay, let me take this into two parts here, but they are related here. Can I take an infant who's just been weaned and start to teach that infant calculus? <laughs> No. Okay. That's what God is trying to say to the people of Israel. Okay. How, can I teach you? Do you want to even learn? No, 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 no. We just want to be uh, a crying baby. We want the whole world to take care of us. Because, you know, the, the baby can't take care of themselves. Okay. And God is saying, no, no, no. You got to learn. You got to take care of yourself. You're going to have to grow up here. Otherwise, I can't teach him. And the response of the people is, that's verse 10, precept upon precept, precept upon precept. Let me kind of explain it this way. They were focused upon the various laws. Okay? But they didn't understand God. Okay. So, you know, people can see the Ten Commandments and see the law of God, but does that mean they truly believe and trust in God? So when Jesus was physically walking here on earth, after he grew up, after being born in Bethlehem, did the religious leaders recognize him? No. No. And they kept quoting and saying, you know, with uh, the Sabbath, okay, why is he healing on the Sabbath? That's doing work. That's wrong. That was their interpretation of Jesus and his, uh, his ministry. And they could not get past it, that Jesus was breaking the rules, so to speak. Well, if you're only concerned about the rules and not concerned about God, you miss the point. So let's go on to verse 11. For by, my, by, I'm sorry, for by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people, to whom he has said, this is rest, give rest. To the weary, this is uh, repose, yet they would not hear. The people of Israel were not wanting to be trusting in God. As a whole, they were still rebelling. So God's word goes out to the Gentiles. This happens during the time of Jesus also. Okay? They reject Jesus. And the disciples, what do they do? They start taking that gospel message out to the Gentiles. So the people of strange lip and of foreign tongues, you could say those are the Gentiles, and the Lord's going to speak to this people. And there's a reason why God is giving this analogy. God is trying to create a jealousy, in one essence, within the people of Israel, where God is saying to the people of Israel, hey, you're not believing and trusting in me, so my word is going to go out to the Gentiles, and it's almost like uh, and no, a parent would say to a child, are you ever going to play with this toy? And the child says, no, I'm not going to play with this toy. Well, fine. Then I'll give this toy to a neighbor. 
oh, I want that toy. That was the goal, okay? <laughs> Unfortunately, the people of Israel didn't quite take that uh, toy back, per se. And instead, they were just focused upon the laws. Okay, Hilda, question? I do, and it's kind of related to this and yet back to a couple of screens about the church. Where do you go when, um, I forgot how exactly how you put that question, where do you go when somebody responded to church? And at a time like today, when the church, in order to follow restrictions, does not allow our membership in the church, um, we have to remember also that God gives each of us his Holy Spirit and teaches each of us. So we cannot go into church, or if the church leader is not following God's word, you may be going to church but not learning what God wants you to learn. If that happens, we have to remember that God is in us. And if we are with like believers, even if it's not in the building with four walls, we are his church. If we are praising, yearning, loving, and obeying God. Okay, yeah, let, let me speak to that a little bit more. Uh, is, uh, and I think, I, let me just try to summarize uh, kind of what you said. As in today's world, uh, again, we live in a world where not all churches are open. And even those that are open may not always be uh, teaching and preaching the right things. And it is the responsibility of each individual Christian to make sure that they are in God's word and are edified by God's word. And so the, one of the things I always try to teach the junior high confirmants is I said, you know, one of these days you, you know, for whatever reason, you may not be here at Peace Lutheran Church. And so in looking for another church, what do you look for? And the, the teaching of God's word should always be number one. And so what do you do when um, uh, we live in a time where, again, there are some states where a lot of churches are still closed? Uh, just be thankful you're not in the state of California. I think they just basically are beginning to start trying to uh, open up some of these churches because of some uh, governmental rulings and the Supreme Court had to intervene and stuff like that. But uh, we, we've been blessed that for Illinois, that happened back in uh, late April. And so we were able to be open already by May. But for other states, they hadn't. And so then what do Christians do when we can't gather? Again, we can still gather within, with God's word. And we should gather together with God's word. So um, like when... Um, the, uh, after World War II, when communism came in to the uh, Eastern European nations, a lot of the Christian groups, uh, churches were closed. Uh, and so these Christian groups had to go underground. But they still continue to want to meet around God's word and to teach each other and to encourage one another. So yes, you're still responsible. Okay, as we say in confirmation class, confirmation and when you are finally confirmed, it basically means I have the basis of the Christian faith and now I'm going to take that responsibility to attach myself more to God's word. And I'm going to take that responsibility to continue my Christian education instead of mom and dad or my sponsors taking that responsibility. Uh, this is what it means to be like the adulting type uh, Christian here. You're going to take that responsibility and you're going to do it. Uh, and then in the face of these difficult times, if the church is not measuring up to what it's supposed to be doing, the Christians still must take that responsibility and find other Christians who are following God's word. And again, to gather around God's word and sacrament. Does that kind of reflect kind of what you were yes, getting at? Yes, what you just said that the Jewish people listening to God and so God gave his word to Gentiles. Right. And so 
God is always faithful so long as we follow him. And for those who are truly following him, if you can go to church and you desire the word of God, he will answer you, he will respond to you, and he will lead you to the people that can help fulfill that desire. Yep, God wants you to grow and trust in him and... Uh, that's why he puts us in communities, and so when the community isn't there, we have to keep on asking God, okay, show me that next community. Show me that next church that is proclaiming God's word. Uh, and I'm still amazed of how many churches are still closed, even in, around here, uh, for various reasons. But uh, again, I don't want to put us on a pedestal and saying we're doing things the right way, but yet at the same time, our doors are open. We want to continue to teach God's word and get God's word uh, out to the people and for people to gather and to hear that word. And that's what we should be doing, uh, even in the midst of these difficult times. So that's why we're taking uh, all the necessary steps that we can to do extra services, to uh, accommodate, and to keep the doors open. Um, because this is what the church should be doing. But uh, on that, I think I'm kind of running out of time here, so um, we're going to stop here at this point, and let's close with the uh, Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.